And the best part of science fiction conventions is you actually get to meet some of the people who write those books. Sometimes they even give readings of books in progress. If you're lucky, you even get to meet them one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, the person who wrote that fantastic book that you always really liked. This is a picture of, of three fairly well-known fantasy writers. The guy who took the picture is married to another fairly well-known fantasy writer, Pamela Dean. And to be able to actually have met some of these folks, whether they're famous you know, or whether they're completely unknown, if you read the book, you've played around inside their imagination. And in some intimate way, you know them. And now you get to meet them face to face. A creation that you love, a desire to share that love with other people who love it, a desire to get closer to, to even get to know the creator. What's religion but that? OK, there are people who are crazy, like the Beatles fans back in the 60s. There are people who get obsessed with sports teams, with pop stars, with food, with science fiction. That can be a religion substitute, but it doesn't have to be. It can be, in a more nuanced way, a religion parallel. And by seeing how that plays out in other worlds and religion, then you can re then reflect back on, well, what does that mean? What's going on? What is this telling me about my own religion? To see how this plays out in the world of science, you can then see and understand how the life of being a scientist changes with time. Now, if you're a scientist, Presumably, you love the stuff you're studying, whether it's meteorites or bugs or dolphins or galaxies. And this love of what it is you're studying keeps you showing up in the lab every day. And so it wouldn't be surprising if, maybe, you wanted to hang out with other people who love doing the same thing, love studying the same thing that you love studying. And technically speaking, you can't actually work in a field without going to scientific meetings and conferences and sharing with everybody else in the field First thing they teach you in a science class, I hope, is in a lab, if you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. And the second thing they better teach you is, if you don't tell anybody what you wrote down, it didn't happen. You gotta go to these meetings. It's part of the process of doing the science. But it's also the social part of just sharing and enjoying being with the other people who love to share and enjoy what you're doing. And incidentally, here's a tip. Anybody in this room who's a student who's thinking of going into science and you're puzzled about which corner of the many parts of your field you can get into, you're looking to go to graduate school, you want to choose which graduate school? Well, in this one they study galaxies, in that one they study double stars. Which do I want to do? Here's, here's, here's a tip. Go to some of these meetings. Find out who are the people doing each of those things and find out who are the guys you'd actually like to hang out with. When I re-entered the Jesuits and, and became a, an astronomer at the Vatican Observatory, I'd been out of research for a few years. I was studying philosophy and theology and stuff like that. I show up at the Vatican Observatory. They say, you can do whatever science you want as long as it's good science. And I'd done about five or six different things. What's the thing I should concentrate on? I started going to these meetings and I found, in my case, the guys who do meteorites have the same kind of bad sense of humor that I do. They laugh at my jokes, I laugh at their jokes. I want to go to these meetings just to hang out with these people. That's the field that I chose to be in. There are other fields where they're mostly interested in showing up the guy up the street, where they're mostly interested in out-grant running the, the, the guy up the street, where they're more interested in showing that they're right and the other guy's wrong, what a pain in the rear end. Life is too short to waste your time in their field. There are too many other good things you can do instead. If it's not fun hanging out with them, it's certainly not going to be fun working with them day in and day out. Don't go into that field. You have to do the science, if you're going to be a scientist, out of love because it's sure not going to be for the money. It's sure not going to be for the power. It sure isn't going to be to attract girls. Obviously, it didn't work for me. 
or guys, because the field is now 50-50 male-female, I really want to know how my meteorites work. I want to know how they're put together. And I love having an excuse to just handle them, to touch them, to know that I'm holding a piece of outer space and something that can remember back in its grains four and a half billion years to the origin of the solar system. I love this stuff. I love this physical universe. I love this creation. I hope you love whatever it is you're doing. Why else would you spend your life doing it? And so, it wouldn't be surprising if, this is a big if, doesn't necessarily have to be, but if, if you believe that there is a creator behind this creation, the source of not only the stars and the planets, but also that inexpressible joy you get when you're studying stars and planets, when you get to play with them, if you believe in that, then maybe you'd want to do the things that let you get closer to that creator. You know, hang out with the people who know that creator, share the experiences you've had with that creation, find out cool bits of trivia about that creator. This is one of the guys I hang out with. <laughs> That's a meteorite we're holding. That's from Mars. He wanted to know, how do you know it's from Mars? And so I explained to him what I'll explain to you. E per causa degli isotopi che si può trovare in questo meteorite, um, I probably should have done it in German, but I think his German's better than mine. <laughs> now, you don't necessarily have to translate a love of the universe into a love of a creator. You know, you don't necessarily have to follow up in your love of dolphins or galaxies by getting all religious about it. Doing the science maybe is just enough. And that's the same for most fans, right? You don't have to go to a convention or dress up to go to the movies. Maybe all you want to do is just read the Harry Potter books. In fact, maybe you think that going to a science fiction convention is not for you. Maybe you're just a little embarrassed about the depth of your passion for some of these books. After all, they're trashy books. They're trashy movies. They're not really serious stuff. And, you know, every, everybody knows that people who go to conventions are geeks who don't have a life. And it would be mortifying to be associated with people like that. I mean, what if somebody saw you there? Like I say, it's a religion parallel, you know? But this also reminds you of something else that science and science fiction and religion all have in common. They're all activities that you could just be a couch potato and consume. You can buy the books. You can watch the science documentaries. You can go to church on Sunday and sit in the pew. On the other hand, they are also all things that you could actually do yourself. You could try them out to a greater or lesser extent, depending on your time and your interests and your abilities. But you know, you like reading science fiction? Have you ever tried writing the stuff? Now, you don't have to be a professional writer. You can just write for yourself, write for your friends. You don't even have to try to sell anything. There's this whole genre called fan fiction where you try to write a story in somebody else's universe. You know, Mary Sue goes to Hogwarts. Once you try doing it, you can upload it to this website or a dozen other such websites. Once you try writing a story for yourself, you learn something about how stories are put together. And you appreciate all the more that it ain't as easy as it looks. You can also sometimes begin to recognize in other stories, ooh, I know what they're doing here. I remember trying to do that in a story once. Ooh, I can see the seams where they sewed together two different scenes that don't quite fit. Or, ooh, that was really slick how that person did that. I never noticed before. Do you like looking at the stars? You don't have to be a professional astronomer. You can have a little amateur telescope, which incidentally, if you have a little amateur telescope, buy my book. Doesn't have to be astronomy. You could be a bird watcher. You could be a gardener. You could be just somebody who likes to go taking hikes and knowing something about the rocks and the trees that you're walking among. Learning the discipline of noticing details, 
learning the discipline of knowing how to take notes and recording it, and also learning the pitfalls of collecting data or spinning theories. That gives you a whole new appreciation of the latest science result that you read on the internet yesterday and how the people reporting that probably got it all wrong. Do you like the idea of being closer to God? You don't have to enter a religious order. You don't have to be ordained. You could volunteer with your local church. You could take a class. You could teach a class for religious ed. You could participate in the liturgies as a lector or a cantor or a Eucharistic minister. On your own, you can do spiritual exercises, take up some kind of meditation practice, read some theology. The idea in this case is not to find Jesus on your own, but to enter into this virtual community of the people who created those meditation programs, the people who wrote those books. You can do charity work through your church, through your religious organization. In the process, you will find yourself encountering God in places and ways and with a depth that I guarantee is going to surprise you. I, I threw this rosary up. The beads in the rosary are all fossils. And the person who put them together wrote a little poem that starts out, I believe in the God of the Burgess Shale. Mm -hmm. The Burgess Shale is the part of this collection of shale in Canada that has the entire fossil record all in one place. So you can sort of follow down the, the evolutionary process. She's also an editor of science fiction. But my point is, this is how you break down the barriers that otherwise will alienate you from big science or big science fiction or big religion. You know, you find exactly those places where the amateur can make a contribution. And these serve as a kind of a gateway into the inner workings of big whatever where eventually, once you're inside, maybe you can have an impact. Or maybe you get co-opted. You know, maybe you'll find out actually why those idiots at headquarters are doing all those crazy things actually doesn't look so crazy from the inside. And for that matter, again, speaking to the students, who's to say you can't do these things professionally? More than one of them professionally. Scientist, check. Religious order, check. Science fiction writer, two out of three. <laughs> I tried. It turns out that the same skills apply to all three activities. This uh, Teresa Nielsen Hayden, the one who made the rosary, is an editor at Tor Science Fiction. She's got this blog. She recently posted this simple four item formula for turning story into fiction. Story's what happened. Fiction is how you tell it. Her four points. Move and keep moving. Make it consequential. Recycle your characters. See if you already have one. What's that all about? Move and keep moving. OK. Tell the story you want to tell without shilly-shallying around. You know, you know that something really cool is going to come up in chapter three, but the reader doesn't know that. You've got to give them some reason to expect something cool happening in chapter three. And you actually are then making a promise that there actually will be something cool in chapter three. You can't move and keep moving unless there's some place you're moving to. You need to know yourself where you're trying to get to when you move. You don't write a story without having some reason for writing it. There's a plot idea, or there's a character, or sometimes there's just a setting. This wonderful quote from C.S. Lewis, how he started the Narnia books, with nothing more than a picture in his head. But whatever it is, the opening of the story has to serve the reason you have for writing the story. It doesn't have to be the picture, but it has to immediately get you on the road to the picture. Make it consequential, which, which she means Make sure that the later events are caused or motivated or shaped by the earlier events. Every causal or consequential link that you have builds the story. It's like, Teresa says, it's like a steel cable holding your narrative together, or like the string and the rosary beads. 
Recycle your characters. You know, when you're peopling later events, use characters you've already introduced. Don't make up new ones. See if you already have one whenever you need some prop or some plot thread, some setting or a minor character. Go back into what you've already written. See if you haven't already planted someplace there something that you can use to keep the story going. More often than not, you find that what you need was already out there in plain sight, and it helps pull the story together. It's just good storytelling. Like me using Teresa Nielsen Hayden because already I was using the picture of her rosary. That's about writing a story. How does this apply to doing science? What's the scientific equivalent of move and keep moving? Well, know what it is you're trying to do. You have to have a clear idea of the specific bit of information you want to get across to tell people about. Well, of course, obviously. Well, you know, we, would any scientist do a science in any other way? Actually, you can. Actually, you do. A lot of people do. One classic way of doing the science wrong is to make the measurement that's easy to make rather than the one that actually tells you what you need to know. You can get flashy results, but you're not advancing the field of the story. You're, you're shilly-shallying. Uh, let me give you an example. I'm interested in my own field. I want to know how a meteorite breaks up when it hits the Earth's atmosphere, okay? So I need to know how strong is a meteorite. Now, I can take a piece of a meteorite bring it into the lab, and measure the pressure at which it breaks. That would tell me the answer. Except nobody likes to make those measurements because it breaks the meteorite. And most meteorite curators are not real happy if you borrow a rock and you return a pile of gravel. So instead, some people, and I'm one of them, I've done this, have measured the Young's modulus of the meteorite, which is how much it flexes for a given bit of pressure. Now, don't worry if you don't know what a Young's modulus is. The point is, you know, stress versus strain and all that. The thing is, it's, it's easy to measure. It doesn't break the meteorite. But it doesn't actually tell you what you want to know, which is, when's the meteorite going to break? It's shilly-shallying. It's not starting immediately towards the answer. Does this mean you shouldn't do this experiment? No, actually, go ahead and do the experiment, but don't claim you're doing the experiment to find out when the meteor is going to break. Realize that you're telling a different story and see what new story that tells you about meteorites that may be a totally different story than when it's going to break. Um, is there anybody here who hasn't heard this tale of the drunk looking for his keys? I'll remind you the old story. Cop on the beat walks down and he sees this drunk in the street. Hands and knees. What's the problem? Well, I live here all for sure, but I dropped my keys. Well, okay, so and they're looking around. You know, it's late at night and there's kind of fog going around and they're feeling around and he looks and he looks and he says, the cop finally says, there's no keys anywhere near here. You sure you dropped them here? And they're like, no, I dropped them around the back at the back door. Well, why are you looking here? The light's better here. <laughs> now, the fact is, you could get lucky. You know, maybe the drunk doesn't find his keys, but he finds a quarter that somebody dropped. You can't count on that. And if you're going to tell a story about it, you tell the story about the quarter, not the keys. Beyond that, though, it's important to remember what ultimately the drunk wants to do, which is not to find his keys, but to get into the house. And maybe you don't need the keys to get in the house. Don't lose sight of your goal. Don't lose sight of where you're trying to get to. Second bit to the formula. Every detail you describe must have a causal connection that gets you to the point you want to get to. Consequential. My editor friend, Teresa, was saying that a good story has to have an internal logic. Things happen for a reason. Obviously, that's also true for science, which is, after all, based on logic and the laws of cause and effect. Uh, I don't know if you can see the, the cartoon, classic one. The guy's pointing to the uh, place where it says, then a miracle occurs in, in his string of equations, and comments, you know, you could be a little more explicit in step two here. 
Um, when I was a grad student a million years ago, I heard one of the worst talks I ever heard because consequential means more than just there's an internal logic. Consequential has a deeper meaning. Uh, th this talk was about Neptune. One of the grand old men of the field, who um, actually I respect and, and liked a lot, got up and gave a half hour seminar on Neptune and some really obscure bit of data that he had spent the last year trying to collect on planet Neptune. And then at the end, as most of these talks, he says, oh, do you have any questions? And somebody raises his hand, some jerk in the back, not me. Yeah, I've got a question, he goes. So what? I mean, who cares? What difference does that stupid bit of data make? Really rude question. Really nasty question. And one that's right on the money. Don't lose sight of the context. Don't lose sight of the bigger picture. Don't lose sight of the answer to the question, so what? Why is it that I should turn the page? What is it ultimately that's dragging me along in the story? If you don't have that kind of consequentialness, there's no point in doing the story. And you've got to tell people what it is. Now, by being consequential, I don't mean that it's got to be, oh, this is the most important thing ever done. Um, I don't know any people, how many people have ever read the So You Want to Be a Wizard series, Diane Duane. Wonderful series with one slight problem. You know, she's written, I think, 12 of these so far. Anybody here ever read these before? Anybody ever heard of them? Yeah, okay. What's the problem with book one? Our heroes save the universe in book one. What the heck are they going to do in book two? <laughs> And she's been fighting this, where like, like the consequences get smaller and smaller for each book. You don't have to solve the fate of the universe. I mean, the universe had gotten along perfectly well without our hero kids in book one. In the same way, I don't insist that every piece of data I get on my meteorite gives me an entire new theory in the origin of the solar system, because we can only handle so many new theories. But. I do want to see how it fits into the bigger question, the bigger story of how the universe works, how biology works, how dolphins work, whatever the larger context is. This sense of consequential ultimately goes back to the deeper question of why are we doing this? Why do we do science? Why do I care how the universe works? Why do we write stories? Why do we read stories? What are we trying to get out of this? More on that soon. Meanwhile, rules three, rules four. Recycle your character. See if you already have one. In science, that means keep it simple. Simplify, simplify. You don't introduce new hypotheses when you can actually use what you've already got to have. We call that Occam's razor. Bertrand Russell formulated it. Whenever possible, substitute constructions out of known entities for inferences to unknown entities. Another way of looking at it is, is in your story, you don't like to have the deus ex machina, the Greek idea of the, the god who pops out of the stage at the end of the play and sets everything right. You can't do that in science. You can't do that in storytelling. How does this apply to religion? Um, this is a picture I'd throw up there mostly because it's a one filter, very unprocessed, raw, all sorts of flaw in it image from the VAT telescope. And yet, for all of its flaws, even before we cleaned it up and, and added the other colors, you can see there's something interesting going on there. Right away you're grabbed, even before you've done the processing. In religion, don't shilly shally. Don't get yourself distracted. You're doing religion because you want to be close to God? All right, start talking to God. Now, don't wait until Sunday. Don't wait until you're in some quiet place. Don't wait until the end of this talk. Now, literally, right now. Say a prayer that I can get to the end of the talk well. <laughs> don't wait for the church to reform all the things that you know are wrong and they've got to fix. It's not going to happen. Don't wait for the perfect liturgy. Don't wait for the perfect guru. 
Don't wait for the perfect you. That's not going to happen either. Start from now, where you are now. And if you need a jump start, use some formula, use some book, use some rule. That's what they're there for. On the other hand, if none of the formulas are where you are, if that's not where you dropped your keys, accept then that you're going to have to stumble around in the dark. But the sooner you start stumbling around, the sooner you're going to find your keys, the sooner you'll be able to get to where you're going. And remember, the decision to get in touch with God, however you do it, is not the end of your story. It's not even the climax of your story. It's the opening page of your story. Watch for developments. Watch for conflict. It'll come. There's no story without conflict. Watch for the tough choice that's the climax that comes along. It's surprising how many people sleepwalk through the really important choices of their lives without ever even noticing that it happened. Watch for the consequences for that choice. You can't skip ahead to the end of the book to see how it's going to turn out. You have to trust the authors. And then, when you get to the end, you discover this is just the first volume of a good long series of books. And it's a shared universe where lots of different authors are writing in the same universe, and you're just one of those authors. Number two, be consequential. You know, suddenly a miracle occurs is lousy religion as much as it is lousy science and lousy storytelling. In the religion case, it's not the miracle I doubt, it's the suddenly. Yeah, things do happen in your life by chance. How you respond to them is not by chance. And how God responds to how you respond is not by chance. There is an internal logic to what's going on between you and God. Sometimes you have to accept that even before you can see it. On the other hand, if it really is just random junk, maybe it isn't from God. Maybe the most remarkable breakthrough that St. Ignatius had when he wrote the, the spiritual exercises, the, the foundation of the spirituality that we Jesuits have, is what he calls discernment of spirits. Rather than trying to reproduce what he comes up with, I'm just going to point out that he came up with something, that he saw the need for people to learn how to tell good urges from bad urges, by which I mean good ideas from ideas that masquerade as good ideas, but actually are really dumb ideas. Not every outside urge is an urge from God. Urges from God have an internal logic that you can learn to recognize. They're not random miracles that suddenly occur, which can be translated into a bigger picture of if it's bad storytelling, it's probably bad religion. Number three, recycle your characters. I don't know, does anybody recognize any of these people? When I went to Google and said, give me Villanova student, that's the first picture that came up. You know some of them? Yes, Mercedes Julia is the woman on the left. OK. Um, They're still here. Our, we have another professor in the, I think, I forget her name, Jonathan, you know she is in the red jacket? She's one of our professors. OK. Um, the point is, the path to God is through your neighbors. You don't have to go out and find strangers. It's the people who are sitting next to you. That's where you're going to find God first. The people you already know. Good storytelling. The same principle. Number four, see if you already have one. Um, for us Catholics, that means recognizing and using the richness that's already in our own religious tradition. If you're not a Catholic, or if you never learned much about your religion, Go out and find what it is that you've got. There's a lot of good stuff there. Maybe it's well disguised, but underneath there's good stuff there. And even if you're a totally secularized, non-practicing nothing from a long line of nothings, you've still been raised in a culture that has good things in it, things you can learn from, things that are inside you already, things that maybe you heard some guy on TV said. Things that maybe you heard in some pop song. Go with it. The movement you need is on your shoulder. God does not suddenly appear out of nowhere via some machinery of the universe. He's on stage all along. 
And with a little practice, you can begin to recognize how to spot him, you know, by his weird sense of humor, if nothing else. The flip side to if it's bad storytelling, it's bad spirituality. If it's good storytelling, it's probably good spirituality. The fact is that the greatest creation that each of us gets to make is our own lives. We each start with materials that have been given to us, the situation we're born in, the talents, limitations, all of the things we were given at birth. But then we have the chance to form them and shape them into something new, something never done before. Our lives are our own personal science fiction novels. How do I know they're science fiction? Well, they take place in the future. Granted, there's only so much that we can write them ourselves. Sometimes the other characters just don't behave the way we wanted them to or the way we expected them to. But it wouldn't be real if everybody else only jumped when you pulled the strings. And actually, that's true of characters in novels, too. More than one writer has described how the characters will take over the book they're writing. This is one of my favorite examples. Madeline Langle wrote this book, The Arm of the Starfish. Again, anybody here ever read this? Know your Madeline Langle? Lovely book, fun book. Yeah, it's a young adult from a zillion years ago. She's written journals describing how she writes books. And uh, she wrote about this one. I had the story thoroughly plotted and there was no character named Joshua in it, but nevertheless, when my hero, Adam, wakes up in the Ritz Hotel in Lisbon, there's a young man sitting in his room, a young man named Joshua. And Joshua was as, Joshua was as much a surprise to me as he was to my hero. I had no idea what he was doing there. I hadn't planned this character. He changed the plot. He changed the plot completely, made her rewrite the half of the book, turned out to be the central character in the book, not the point of view character, but the one around which everything else revolved. Anyone who's written, and that's why I say it's a cool idea to write your own science fiction, knows this feeling of suddenly, that's what's happening, that's what's going on. And of course, it's also true of science. The universe doesn't always behave the way we expect it. When that happens, it's called opportunity. You know, the science fiction writer Isaac Asimov said, the most exciting thing you hear in a lab is not Eureka, but rather, hmm, that's funny. The art, and it is an art, it's based on a hunch, closely related to a feeling. The art is knowing when to attack the funniness by assuming uh, I made a mistake in my setup, and when to admit you've actually found something new something real, you know, the faster than light neutrinos, classic example right now, we're seeing that play out. Did they really find something or did they make some incredibly subtle mistake in the experiment? This is a way that treating religion or science as story can help you out because we've all read enough stories to know instinctively when a story gets it right and those same instincts help guide us into giving credence to a particular possible scientific explanation. Sometimes hearing it as a story lets us ask if we believe in it enough to spend the time looking for the data that's going to prove or disprove it. Because that's the crazy thing about doing science. You have to have a hunch ahead of time before you make the decision, am I going to invest two years following this up? You have to have the hunch ahead of time to know how you're going to follow it up. You have to have an idea what the answer looks like before you've got the answer. Where did that come from? It comes from our sense of story. It's no accident that the Gospels, you know, the heart of Christian scripture, are stories. They're not theological discourses. Jesus taught by telling parables. We can hear a story. We can evaluate it against our own human experience of life. And by instinct, we can draw a lesson from it. You know, sometimes it's not the lesson you expected. The, the, the prodigal son, the story goes, the guy heard the story of the prodigal son, you know, all the story, he's about taking care of the pigs and 
then decides to go back home and, and go back to his father and say, somebody says, okay. He goes back home. His father greets him. What happened to the pigs? Who's taking care of the pigs now? Well, that's a good question. On the other hand, how many people remember the epistle that they heard on Sunday? You never remember the epistles. They're deep and profound and you're immediately forgettable. Story is something you remember. And let's not forget another important distinction between reality and story. Reality is what happened. Story, fiction is how we tell it. One of the differences between story and real life, which is what you learn when you try to write it yourself, is that writing a story, following these rules, being careful not to introduce new characters, gods popping out of the machinery, it's artificial. It's not real. Real life is messier. Real life is not the controlled environment we create in a lab. Like those in, you know, classic after-school specials you used to watch on TV, the science we write up on our papers is a story based on true events, which is not quite the same thing as the reality. One of the reasons I trust the Gospels to tell me things that really happen, and I don't mean the, the parables, I mean the stuff around the parables, is that actually there's way too much messy inconsistency in them to reflect a well-crafted bit of fiction. Uh, the early theologian Tertullian was trying to get this apart with, but he, when he came up with this often misunderstood axiom, it's certain because it's impossible. What I think he means is that no one trying to invent a believable story would have made up what happens in the Gospels to Jesus. We actually have a whole literature of fantasy and science fiction to show us what good storytellers actually do make up. And in general, a science fiction novel is a whole lot more self-consistent than the Gospels, and the philosophy in it is not nearly as profound. Um, I, one of the most important steps in a young science fiction fan's journey to maturity is realizing that Heinbein's ability to sound as if he knew what he was talking about was a whole lot greater than his ability to actually know what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. And if you've read Robert Heinlein, you know exactly what I mean. And if you haven't, read him. He's a lot of fun. And then eventually you'll become mature by realizing he didn't know what the hell he was talking about, but he sure could sound good. Knowing how stories work especially after you've tried writing your stories, gives you the intuition to judge not only what the story is trying to say, but also is the author being honest with you. It's not quite the same thing as whether or not the story is factual, but you can at least be learn to judge whether the writer thinks it's telling the truth. And sometimes it's good to know. But that goes back to it being a gut feeling. One that you can sometimes justify after the fact with logic, yeah, but as with most logic, the instinct comes first. Spending time with stories helps you to exercise and develop that intuition. Every student of physics knows the phrase, intuitively obvious to the casual observer. We depend on intuition. I don't think most descriptions of science give enough credit to the intuitive or the emotional side to it. We are not divided into Kirks and Spocks, you know? For that matter, neither was Kirk or Spock. One actually was very clever, the other actually was a mass of emotions, and if both of them tried to hide it, it was for reasons that were both emotional and clever. It is in our emotions that we find out not only how we do it, where we get the instincts to know which experiment to do next, but the deeper question, the one I promised all along, why do we do this stuff? Why do I get passionate about science fiction books? Even books that I can recognize are not great literature, but I can't stop myself from picking up the next one. Why do I keep showing up in the lab, staying outside in the cold night looking through a telescope? What is it I'm really looking for? Why do I keep putting up with all of the frustrations of dealing with a large, clumsy, top-heavy, badly run, over-centralized bureaucracy that's utterly insensitive to what's actually happening 
at headquarters. I'm talking about NASA, you realize. <laughs> Did you think I was talking about something else? No. I mean, you can bitch and moan all you want about NASA, and rightly so, but at the end of the day, it was the only outfit that ever got us to the moon. But for that matter, why did we want to go to the moon? There's a philosophical school of thought that says that human beings do things for pleasure. Obviously, that can't be right because, if anything, we're doing it for the hope or the expectation. But you have to open the book before you can enjoy the book. And of course, most expectations are never completely met. And none of them last forever. That's why we keep opening new books. From the time we were kids, We've known about the shiny toy that breaks the first time you try to play with it, the rich dessert that looks better than it tastes and makes you sick afterwards. A lot of temptations turn out that way. Sex and drugs and rock and roll, yeah. If rock and roll were the answer, then why do we keep trying to turn the music up to 11? If, if drugs were the answer, then why do we keep looking for a new drug? Why do we keep trying to drink our way out of depression? If sex was the answer, then why do we stick around in relationships that were bad ideas to begin with? We keep trying over and over to do the same things that never have worked, hoping next time they're going to deliver, they're going to deliver, they're going to deliver, you don't know what they're going to deliver, but you know you want it really badly. That's the behavior you see in, in, in drug addicts, in anorexics, in politicians. <laughs> and then... There comes along, out of nowhere, the sweet taste of joy that appears for no apparent reason, without previous cause, and it leaves you with a blessed memory and a longing for something that can't be described, much less captured. Okay, it's getting near the end of the talk. Let me just cut to the chase. Another gimmick from storytelling. St. Augustine had it right 1,700 years ago when he wrote, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. All of our desires, whether it's the desire that makes us open the book, or the desire that makes us do the science, or the desire that makes us participate in the church, all of them are ultimately desires for God. We write in order to imitate the creator who is himself the author of everything. We read, we read other people's creations to imitate the God who enjoys the creations that we're making of our lives. We do science because of the exquisite joy we get in feeling close up the breath of the creator who made this universe and in following with delight the clever story that he's woven into the way he made it. And this is the ultimate point of unity between science and fiction and religion. They are all enjoyed by the same human being who ultimately is looking for the same rest in the arms of the same creator. That's why this world matters. And yet we know what we see in this world is a faint shadow of the world to come. Like a good book, the truth is there to be found, but... Like a good book at the end of the day, it's here is only a thin tissue of words pointing to something, hinting at something that cannot be captured, but only suggested. The book, true as it can be, is not the same thing as the reality. The scientific paper, profound as it may be, is not the same thing as the universe it's trying to describe. Our religion can lead us to God, but our religion is not the same thing as God. It's not meant to be worshipped. What we have at hand in these books, in this science, in this religion, is the product of our own creativity, the product of our own God-given talents to imitate God by creating. It contains and it expresses true knowledge. That's why we call it science. But it is, at the end of the day, something we've invented for ourselves, which is why they call it fiction. It's all science fiction. Thank you very much.
I'm not supposed to be clever and say that this was a great story and that you give us the philosophy of. And, but rather than try to do that, just be very thankful for having taken us on this little journey. Thanks. For having created a story in which we could each have a place. And for being open to your questions. Or stories. Or stories. <laughs> yeah. I just finished reading a book by Richard Dawkins called The Magic of Reality, which is basically a children's book. It's wonderfully written. It's a wonderful story. And the reason I've had it's had all kinds of multiple ideas and it's just great. But he's, you know, a, an avowed and somewhat militaristic atheist. Well, the militaristic part of this book is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yes. But, but, you know, it's, you read this and say, uh, like you said it earlier, you know, if, if, there, if you tell good stories, there's a spiritual quality there. And I can't find it right now. Well, it, it's another thing. Um, there's a book that just came out in Britain, not here yet, of uh, Jonathan Sachs, the chief rabbi of England, written this book called uh, The Great Conversation and The Great Partnership, The Great Something. Uh, it starts out by saying there's a difference between religion and science is that religion is about telling a story, and science is only about the facts. And I was reading that as I'm putting this together. But no, 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 they're both story. And yet, Ultimately, I agree with Jonathan Sachs much more than I would with what you're talking about. Um, the trouble is that too many scientists, especially scientists who were not educated at a Villanova, but were educated in Britain, where they separated the science and the philosophy into these separate worlds, don't know enough about what science itself is. Scientists tend to be horribly bad at reflecting on what it is that they themselves do. And uh, they'll talk about the purity of the logic and the purity of the reason. And it's, reason and logic are wonderful, but they're not pure. And no computer can do science. No video camera can do an experiment. Or even record the experiment properly. It takes a human bit of creativity to look at it and realize what it is you're looking at and to draw out of it the lesson you want to draw. And that changes with the story you're telling. Classic example, not original with me. Uh, you look at a, a, a pendulum and a clock. Everybody knows it's a pendulum. Back and forth. In fact, we're all getting sleepy now. <laughs> if you're Aristotle, what you notice is that the pendulum comes to rest. And this fits your story of how, how everything has a natural resting place. If you're Galileo, you notice that the pendulum keeps the same period, whether it's long or short. If you're Newton, you say, oh, there's only friction at the pivot. If I could get rid of the friction, it would go forever. It's the same pendulum. The videotape is showing you the same videotape of a pendulum. It's the human story. Because all of these three things are true. <clears throat> Newton's laws, to a certain degree, are true. You can use Newton's laws to create a clock that uses Galileo's pendulum to keep time that you've got to wind up once a day because Aristotle had a point. And it all depends on the story, the context within the story you're telling. And I think Richard Dawkins is a wonderful storyteller and gets it right even though he doesn't know. Another, uh, yeah, most of these new atheists are mostly old, white, and British. Um, and I, I, you know, I have ambitions to be old and white male myself. So, uh, <laughs> but I'll be British. Uh, another one who fits that is the, the children's writer, Philip Pullman, who has written this children's series that has two groups of bad guys and nobody is good at it. One group of the scientists, and they're all evil. And the other group of the religious people, and they're all evil. And I'm reading his own. Gosh, that's me. <laughs> but he's a good storyteller. And he keeps you turning the pages. And he's an honest storyteller, so that at the end of the book, everybody grows old and dies, and it's the end, and it's the most miserable downer of an ending. <laughs> but it is completely consistent with the universe he's created. And I've read other books of people who try to be Christian and good, and you go, oh, what a piece of absolute rubbish. Because <laughs> they're, they're not telling the truth. They're telling the fairy tale they want. Think that, and they don't believe in themselves. 
Well, I think Dawkins is telling the truth as he sees it, and that's yeah. really important. It's a perspective, you know, that, uh, and it gives a good storytelling. Mm -hmm. so, but the problem is, there need to be people who are believers who can tell the same story with a different perspective. Well, and uh, or people who can say, this is a great book, go ahead and read it, because he's, he's showing you God, even though he doesn't realize it. The more that he tells the truth, the more he's showing you God. He would be embarrassed to, to hear it that way. But take joy in embracing what he's got to give us. Another other story here. Yeah. I have a question. Um, this wasn't really addressed, but you know, do you believe in the Big Bang Theory and the expansion of the universe mm -hmm. and all that? Oh, and it, do you believe then that the creation story in the Bible then is more like a science fiction story or how people saw it? You're saying that as if there's something wrong with science fiction. No, 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 even the science, even the Big Bang is a it's story. It's a story, right, right. But they're finding so much evidence. But yes, but, 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 but tell me, 3,000 years from now, how the cosmologists of the year 5,000 are going to look back at the stuff being published today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Which is true. The stuff from 5,000 years, with the stuff from today, and the stuff from 3,000 years ago. It's all true. Which is we're learning always more and more and more. That's the difference between science and what's in the Bible. Um, are there any scientists in this room? Are there any astronomers in this room? Have you uh, ever actually read Newton's Principia? No, of course not. <laughs> Why would you waste your time? On the other hand, are there any theologians in this room? Have you actually read the Bible? Yeah, it's still worth reading after 3,000 years. Science books go out of date. The Bible doesn't go out of date. Ergo, the Bible is not a science book. And, and they're all telling stories. Stories are how we communicate truth. But it's always, in a, sense, in a sense, a way that's artificial. In a way that selects, highlights, but isn't all of reality. And none of it will all be, and everything all of reality. There was a Howard Gardner writing Frames of the Mind. Mm -hmm. And that, I'm thinking of that with everything you said, because people look at something individually. Yeah. And you could be a writer, you could be a mathematician. Yeah. He names like 11 mm -hmm. capacities of human beings. It's, I, probably that's one of those things, as I say, that you know is in our culture. It's good stuff. And even if you're not religious, you can find. And probably, I, as soon as you said that, I'm sure I've read that, I'm sure I've subconsciously stolen from that. Yeah. But uh, if it's a good idea, somebody's already had it. Of course, if it's a bad idea, somebody's already had that, too. <laughs> I just wanted to go back to your point earlier about science going out of date. I find myself quite frequently going back to very early works. Not for the scientific content as much as the philosophical content. Yes. And, and I myself am not religious, mm -hmm. but I find great inspiration. For example, Timothy Ferris is one of my favorite authors because mm -hmm. he's a philosopher of science. Mm -hmm. and, and he has this incredible talent of finding pearls in the scientific literature. And, and he writes compendiums of, of, of these scientific pieces that are so profound that I find and it's a great inspiration in reading those. I was on a TV show with him once. I may not ever know. It was yeah, some PBS film. And the guy had us there thinking he was going to act scientists and Tony Ferris and get into a big, well, we got into a big argument over The two of us were ganging up on the guy who brought us together. <laughs> <laughs> because he is, he's, he's just, he's full of joke. And and to me, that sense of joy, that sense of delight, is a sign of him. You said a sign of the presence of God. You can also say it's the motor. It's the fuel that, that runs our motor. It's why we do it. Because if you're not getting that, you're not going to do it in the long run. I see it's 5.30, and I guess people are going on their way.
might resolve a little refresher. We can talk again.